to use your account. So for that, we say thank you. For the members, we would like to welcome you to this session. And uh, as we had discussed earlier in the, in the group, it is a session of just uh, share, members sharing knowledge among themselves and, and uh, sharing the little knowledge they have or the much knowledge they have about the various topics that uh, members uh, showed interest in. And for, for this one, it is now uh, a session for Earthquake. Earthquake design based on uh... Hello, Lawrence, are you there? No, no, I can't hear Lawrence. He was already there. He was talking. Uh, right now, are you hearing him? No. Uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, Doctor, you can now take over because these are some of the topics that we are interested in. Young engineers would like to learn more. So at this very moment, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Fundi. Dr. Fundi, take us through, introduce yourself a bit, and then take off. Thank you so much, Dolo. It's my pleasure to be in this platform to share knowledge. Today we are going to, uh, you know, share a little bit on uh, seismic design to Eurocode 8. Eurocode, there are new design codes which have taken over from the British standards. Currently we have Eurocode up to Eurocode 8. Uh, I mean nine, sorry, and um, they they have been um, made in such a way that uh, each part of Eurocode uh, tackles a different material. Uh, basically, Eurocode eight um, uh, part one uh, of the year two thousand and four is what uh, we'll be using today. I'm hoping members are having copies. We'll take us through a small introduction. Um, hosting it together with my colleague uh, by the name Abda, Abdi Fatah Jama. He will uh, start it up and then I will uh, conclude. We'll ask members to, to kindly give us their feedback. You can note down as we proceed, we'll uh, wish to take your questions possibly towards the end. My name is um, Dr. Isaac Fundi. I'm uh, biased towards structural engineering. And um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Ndolo. Hello. Hello, uh, continue. Yes, Abdi, I think from there, can we begin with Abdi? The topic is seismic design to Eurocode 8. This is just one module. Uh, we expect to take it in terms of uh, modules because again, covering the whole bit at a go, it might be too much. So we have divided it into three modules. Abdi, if you are ready, I can take you to the next slide. Kindly, kindly do. Engineer Fundi. Please, Abdi, you can proceed from there. And um, here we are going to look at uh, the first module. We are going to only cover the seismic actions uh, in terms of loading, the stress development, and process at the story levels. So we will take you through from uh, this from scratch. How do you go about uh, the loadings? Uh, what are the things to look at? What are the tables that you're going to be referring to? And all through that, then up to the end, whereby we can get the stresses that are developed and forces that will be affecting the building at each every level. Then in module two now, we will be having a, a Ndolo, can you just stop the sharing, the, the admitting thing on my end because I'm using a phone and uh, it is coming on my screen. 
So on, on, on this med module, uh, we are going to take uh, issues of, uh, for the second module, we're going to look at the issues of subframe analysis. Um, and once you get the, 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 the uh, lateral forces at, uh, at the story levels, uh, uh, what kind of moments can you get from such kind of uh, forces? Then uh, another thing, uh, moments and shear forces are that particular forces. Then the last part of the module, we're going to do now the design part of it. So after doing the normal uh, static loadings, after doing after doing those normal static loadings, then uh, and and now you have the moments due to the normal gravitational loads, and 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 and, and now you have also moments uh, due to now the earthquake. And how do you go about designing it? So that those are the things that we are going to look at the third part of it. So kindly next, Engineer Fundi. Engineer Fundi, can you take the slide to the, to the second slide? Third yes, sure, slide. you have. Yeah, we are on slide number three, Abdi. So the introduction uh, in this uh, in this course, uh, we are going to do, uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, earthquake. And when we're looking at earthquake, earthquake causes a uh, ground motion in random fashion, uh, both horizontally and uh, vertically. Uh, earthquake motions uh, at a given point on surface is represented by an elastic ground acceleration and spectrum. So when we are looking at earthquake in a building, uh, when you're designing a building uh, that should now uh, be be good in earthquake, you have to look at the stability of the building. Uh, in matter stability of the building here, we are going to check that the building is uh, as a whole uh, can resist the moderate uh, earthquake uh, 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 force. And again, a building as a whole should have the strength aspect so that uh, uh, the strength aspect of the building also should also, the, the building should also resist earthquake without any failure. And the third part of it is uh, if you're designing a building for, for resistance against earthquake, the building also, in case there's an earthquake uh, uh, action on it, it must have the serviceability whereby the building should meet the minimum functional requirements, for example, for evacuations, if uh, all structural elements are failing, it gives people time. It should not be like a time bomb. So those are the areas that uh, when you're designing a building, you should ensure that your building can withstand those three areas, whereby your building should be stable, and it should have stability against the uh, earthquake act, uh, actual uh, forces, and it should also has to have strength so that uh, it can also withstand the uh, earthquake uh, failures. And again, it should have the serviceability part of it. So those are the three areas that when you're designing should always run in your mind that as an engineer, you should always know that the building that you're designing should always have those kind of uh, characteristics. Then there's this earthquake force. You know, an earthquake force is uh, one of uh, the types of force as a dynamic forces. And uh, in dynamic forces, we can have like three, like two, 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 two types of them. Like for example, we can have the earthquake force. And another example that is usually there, it is the wind force. So both of them act uh, uh, act uh, horizontally, and some uh, for the earthquake it does have an effect vertically and horizontally. But now the difference between the earthquake uh, force and uh, maybe wind force, uh, it's that, that that the ground motion in uh, in earthquake is cyclic uh, around the neutral uh, position, uh, while in, uh, in 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 wind the, the reversal of load occurs over a large duration of time. When it comes to maximum forces, maximum forces measured in uh, when when we are dealing with earthquake loads, uh, it's measured in terms of years. Sometimes the return it's in, in, it's called a return period, and the maximum force reached when it when we are dealing with wind, it can be in average of days. So kindly next, uh, Fundi. Yes, you are there, Jan Jama. So, so, so the third part of this uh, session is uh, now a seismic structure, uh, a structural system, you know, and that one is in clause 5.22. And when we talk about seismic structural system, uh, we look at the aspect of uh, uh, during an earthquake we, of a given intensity, uh, the magnitude of force induced in structure will always depend on three things. The first thing is the damping mechanism. The second thing is the ductility. And the third thing is the energy the dissipation uh, capacity of the structure. So when we talk about damping, what do you mean by damping? Damping is the phenomenon that makes uh, any vibrating body stroke structure to decay in amplitude of motion gradually, gradually by means of energy dissipation through various mechanisms. Uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say here is the gradual transformation of energy within the vibrating system is referred as damping. And damping ultimately seizes uh, the, the vibration motion of the structure. It could be compared with a gradual application of a brakes, for example, in a moving car or a vehicle for it to stop. 
So had there been no, no dumping motion in, in structures, uh, that would mean that uh, we will have continuity indefinitely. I mean, the, the, the earthquake force will have continuity. It will never die. But due to dumping now, it kills that vibration to zero. So that's, uh, that, that, that plays a very important uh, role in terms of structural dynamics. So when we talk about ductility and sometimes uh, stiffness effect of, in, in a building, uh, a ductile structure is a structure that has the ability to contort and dissipate energy during an earthquake. Uh, is therefore also advantageous as it can keep uh, deforming without reaching the ultimate failure or, or collapse. For example, of a ductile structure is a, a properly detailed uh, steel frame, for example, with a, a degree of elasticity, so that this structure does not uh, just uh, uh, collapse immediately. It allows to dissipate energy. And, and when you look at that, now we will have that uh, elasticity, you know, the degree of elasticity that uh, is, will enable it to undergo a large deformation before it is onset of failure. So when, it, when you look at the ductile, it, it has a component also, it goes hand in hand with stiffness. So stiffness is also a measure of how much force is required to dissipate in a building by a certain amount. Yeah? Uh, if, uh, if, if, if it requires more force to shift building A, for example, uh, than building B, uh, we would uh, say that building A is stiffer than building B. And stiffness can be adv uh, advantageous uh, with respect to earthquake uh, damage, damage uh, because uh, it can limit the deformation dem demands on a building. But again, if you, however, have too much of a good, uh, of, of a structure which is too stiff, also pay is not a good thing. It makes it become brittle now. So we will be prone to failure, which will lead to prone to failure under relative small deformation demand. For example, a brittle structure is uh, an unreinforced, uh, for an reinforced masonry building, which will, uh, which will tolerate very little uh, displacement before the onset of the damage and failure. Now, now when we come down now to, after, after, after having the concept of now uh, ductility and again, the damping aspect of now a building can, now dissipate the energy and, and again, understanding energy dissipation for a, a, the capacity in, of a structure, then we'll come out to, to see now the, 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 the lateral loading system in a, in a, in a, in a, in a structure. So, so under, under, under this lateral load uh, resisting systems, eh, in Eurocode uh, uh, 8, uh, it has been described very well that we will be having into like four categories, whereby we will be having moment resisting uh, space frames. Uh, we will be having things like uh, bearing wall system, we'll be having things like building frame system, and we will having the dual system. So when we look at, uh, for example, the moment uh, resisting frame system, these are, they, they, they resist the force uh, in members and joined primarily by flexural and uh, relay on the frame to carry both uh, vertical and uh, horizontal uh, and lateral loadings, for example. And the moment re resisting frame can be constructed, uh, can constructed or can be can be constructed of concrete, uh, again masonry or even steel. And there are five types of moment resisting frame system. So we have the first type is the steel and concrete. Uh, let's say example steel and concrete uh, special moment resisting system, which is SMRA. The second part of it is the masonry moment uh, resisting uh, wall frames, uh, which is uh, again MMR. WF indicated there. Uh, the third part of it is the concrete uh, intermediate moment resisting frames, uh, which is IMRF. Uh, the fourth part, part of it is the steel or concrete. It can be either steel or concrete, ordinary moment resisting frames, which is OMRF. And, and we have the last part to be the special steel truss moment uh, frames, which is SRMF as indicated there. Then below there, uh, after, after dealing with the moment now resisting a space frame, we have now the wall bearing systems also, because we have four types of systems. Under the wall bearing systems, you know, a wall bearing system is a structural system that relies on uh, the same element to resist both uh, gravity and lateral load. There are two types of uh, structural walls under that, where we are having a bearing wall and a shear wall. So on, a, on, on, a, on, on, on that, on a shear wall uh, or a fractural wall uh, is, is, a, is a wall that is designed to resist the lateral force in its own play. And uh, the lateral force are resisted by the shear wall, uh, sometimes in a light bracing in, uh, in the bearing walls and also bra or, or, or breast frames. 
So shear walls and, uh, and bearing walls ca can play under the bearing wall system. And now the third part of it is the building frame system where we have the steel breast steel and we have the light frame wall. Then the last uh, part of it is the dual system where you can combine both of these and that forms now the dual system. Uh, so on the third uh, part of it, we are going to talk about uh, two things. We are going to talk about the construction techniques to improve earthquake resistance. And again, we will touch also on uh, the general things that, uh, you know, the, the specific measures which uh, someone can take in, uh, during the design and, uh, and, and during the construction period of, of, the, of the building so that uh, the building to be good in when, when it comes to earthquake uh, resisting, resistance. So structural uh, simplicity is very important. When you're, when you're designing a building, make sure that your building has structural simplicity. Uh, it will perform better in earthquake. So when we say that, we mean that existence of clear and direct path for, for the transmission of seismic forces. So load path for your load path should be very clear. The transmission of load path from one element to another should have a uh, very simplified uh, structure uh, way of uh, transferring loads. Then we have the uniformity, symmetry, and, uh, and redundancy. So uniformity in plan is guided by, by even uh, distribution of structural elements, thus increasing uh, redundancy and redistribution of ac uh, action effects. Then we have the aspect of bidirectional uh, resistance and stiffness. So building should resist horizontal actions uh, in any direction. Uh, however, it should limit uh, development of excessive uh, displacement. Then lastly, we have the adequate uh, foundation where you're placing your building and, and, and the design of the foundation that you're going to, uh, to, to put uh, for the building. So, so, so the design uh, and, uh, and construction of the foundation and its connection to the superstructure uh, to enable the whole building to, is subjected to a uniform seismic excitation so that there's no uniform uh, distribution in seismic load. So again, even the way you tie the be the way you tie the foundation below there. Let's say, for example, you have a very soft soils. You have to tie the foundation together so that you make it act as a unit. So those are the areas uh, when it comes to construction you can look at, and 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 there are these other specific measures uh, which which aims at reducing the uncertainty of structural response uh, in, in in a building. You know. You have to have like that to the extent of, possi of possible uh, structure should have a simple and regular forms, both in plan and elevation uh, in order to ensure an overall uh, dissipative and uh, ductile behavior, brittle failure or uh, what, what we call premature formation of an, an, an unstable mechanism should be avoided. Uh, to, to this end, resort is made uh, to, to capacity design procedures uh, this is used to obtain, let's say, hierarchy of resistance in various uh, structural components and failure modes necessary for ensuring a suitable plastic mechanism and for avoiding brittle failures modes. So you see, when we talk on another point is we have the special care should be also uh, exercised in the design uh, of, the, of the regions where nonlinear response is uh, for, for, foreseeable since uh, the seismic uh, performance of a structure is largely dependent on the behavior of uh, these critical regions uh, or elements. So those are the things that we can uh, try to look at when we do construction. There's, uh, there's the issue of uh, when you look at um, mass irregularity, there's issue of uh, vertical discontinuity. So those are the things that we can look at that. Then uh, I think from the next slide, I think uh, my, my, my fellow co-host can, can take over from there. Uh, he will take you through the seismic vibration controls. So kindly- Thank you so much. Please. Thank you so much, uh, Abdi. Members, we now want to look at seismic vibration control. In other words, how can um, uh, seismic actions be controlled? Basically, there are three proposed ways or uh, instruments that can be able to be used to control uh, earthquake uh, vibrations. Uh, we have what are referred to as the, se uh, the passive seismic control systems. We have the active seismic control systems, and uh, we have a combination of the two, which then makes up the hybrid seismic control. Uh, in the passive seismic control, these are kind of devices which uh, they don't require an additional energy uh, to, to make them to be operational they are automatically activated by an earthquake. So when an earthquake motion occurs, uh, they automatically get uh, activated. Uh, I've listed a few examples there, three of them, like for example, the energy dissipation devices, the base isolation techniques and dynamic oscillators. 
Of course, for the active, on the other hand, is that um, you have to connect them to a power source so that they can now be able to, uh, to be activated uh, every time an earthquake occurs. The major disadvantage is that uh, possibly the power source can be hit down by an earthquake before then it has uh, been fully activated. So that is possibly one of the main disadvantage of the active seismic control uh, devices. And a hybrid seismic uh, control system, uh, of course, borrows from both uh, passive and, and, and active. In the next one, then we thought of um, providing a bit of uh, terms and, uh, and abbreviation of, of some of the terms that possibly are going to use uh, in this next discussion. Um, uh, my colleague has talked about ductility. The code, and here the code is the Eurocode 8, provides um, three kinds of ductility, depending on the kind of material that has, uh, has, has, has been used. As you know, he pointed out very well that um, uh, ductility being the capacity of a building material or its system itself to absorb energy and uh, then to, trans, uh, to transmit from the elastic to post-elastic or the, uh, the, the plastic zone. Uh, so we have the three uh, ductility classes there, as you're going to see uh, discussed in the code, you know, DCL being ductility class low, ductility class medium, and then ductility class high. Uh, we have this term, which is very common, the A subscript GR, which means that it is the reference peak ground acceleration. Now, the beauty of uh, Eurocode is that it has allowed national uh, annexures to be added in it. Or like, for example, you can have values being determined from region, say our region, East Africa region, or West Africa, whichever that kind of region. And then we, we document those values and then be able to use it. So AGR, as you're going to see, there are some values that have, I have uh, find them out. There is a term there, S subscript ET, which is the elastic ground uh, acceleration response spectrum. Uh, we have natural uh, period, which of course depends on the term uh, CT and it depends on the kind of the moment re resisting frame. We now know about the different kind of moment resisting frames that can be, can be employed when it comes to earthquake. And then of importance, again, there we have the base shear force. Basically, this is the force that we want to determine at the end of the day so that we can, we can then distribute it at, um, at the flow levels or at the column uh, beam intersection points. So in this next slide here, we have the seismic actions. And basically seismic actions, there are three parameters that uh, determine uh, the seismic resistance of, of a building. The first one is its seismic intensity. Now two things, there is seismic intensity and seismic magnitude. Uh, intensity being the amount of damage that can, can occur, say how many buildings got broken, how many bridges, how many roads are disconnected, and so, so and so. Uh, but then the bit of magnitude is what is the amount. In this case, if you're measuring it in terms of richer scale, so what is the amount of richer scale that you're talking about? In that case, then it will be uh, the magnitude. So under seismic intensity, we have energy dissipation capacity, of course, again, which is anchored on the reference peak ground acceleration. And I have provided some values here. These values of uh, peak ground acceleration, uh, as I've said, the term A subscript GR, depends on different kind of seismic zone. Now, these are values that have been borrowed from tabulated figures. However, uh, for some of us, I believe you understand that there is a Kenyan design code dealing with um, seismic, uh, the code of practice for design and construction of building and other structures in relation to, to earthquake, which was developed in the year 1973. Now it provides in our region, there is a, there is a zone, uh, a Kenyan map, which has been zoned into different kind of zone. The zonation is beginning from zone five all the way to zone, to zone eight and above. Uh, so the values there we are going to see later on how we can be able to use them in relation to this or what sometimes they can be referred to as the modified Mercalli uh, values. The second bit under the seismic intensity is the ductility classes, of course, tabulated in clause number 5.2.1, and I've talked about them, the DCL, DCM, and DCH. The second parameter is the building importance. Now, building importance, uh, 
uh, values have been tabulated in table number 4.3 of the Euro code. We are going to get that later on. But basically, the reliability of differentiation divides building importance into uh, depending on four matters. The size of the building, its value, the importance to the public, and the probability of human loss. Say, for example, under the probability of human loss, are you designing an agricultural farm or are you designing a residential building? Now, those two kind of buildings, the, the probability of loss to them, they differ uh, based on their occupants. The last one under the parameter there is the ground type, which is very important because most of the buildings are tied up to a, to a, to a stratum, which in most cases it will be the ground. And um, it has been classified and discussed in clause number 3.1.2, uh, depending on three things. One is the type of deposit. Uh, the second is the average shear wave velocity. And there are different kinds of waves that can be developed once an earthquake occurs. We have relay waves, we have shear waves, we have love waves, quite a number of them. And uh, of course, the depth of the layers or the depth of the stratas. So then that discusses the, the, the parameters of uh, seismic resistance. Then after that, I provided here the methods of analysis, which I'm referring to clause number 4.3.3 of Eurocode 8. Now there are three uh, major methods of analysis. The first one is the lateral force analysis. We have the response spectrum model and the nonlinear uh, kind of model. Now the, the lateral force analysis are provided the criteria there as discussed in the code. For you to use this method, then your building must be regular in both in plan and in elevation. Um, and, and it has, again, to have the fundamental period being less than four TC. We are going to see what is TC. Um, and again, the fundamental period has to be less than 2.0 of a second. One limitation of it again is that the building height must not be more than 10 meters. Now that, that's a regulation, but we're going to see later on on how it can be able to be, to be worked out when you're dealing with buildings which are more than uh, 10 meters. The second kind of method of analysis is the response spectrum model, uh, and it requires also the building to be regular in plan and irregular in elevation. However, uh, it has not provided any limitations on uh, the fundamental uh, period. One thing to note about the lateral force analysis method, it is also that it is sometimes referred also as the equivalent static analysis. In this method, it considers that all the loading are not transmitted in between the members, the vertical members, like for example, columns. So we have the principle of lumped masses that are taken only at the point of the flows. I have also included there that if you want to know more about regularity, there are two clauses that can be able to define it. I'm hoping that um, we manage to get copies of the Eurocode 8, part one. So if you check in clause number 4232 and clause 4233, we'll be able to see the definition of regularity of, uh, of, of, of buildings. So here then I've expounded more on um, the analysis methods. Uh, it's a continuation of it. So basically there are two kinds of methods we have uh, depending on the building uh, structural characteristics. We can have two methods. We have the linear elastic analysis and we have the nonlinear method. Under the linear analysis method uh, analysis, we have the lateral force method and we have the model response spectrum, which is uh, defined in clause uh, 43323. And then under the nonlinear method, again, there are, there, are, there are two methods. We have the nonlinear static, which sometimes uh, commonly referred to as the pushover analysis method, and the nonlinear uh, time history, or sometimes defined as the, as the dynamic. Now, the route that you're going to take uh, in, in this uh, presentation is where we are considering the linear elastic uh, analysis method and we'll consider the, the lateral force method. Now, as I said, in this linear analysis uh, elastic method, it provides a limitation that the building must be less than 10 meters high. So if you check in clause number 4331 under subsection 11P, it provides therefore that if the building has a height of more than 10 meters, the seismic action forces that we are going to get at the end of the day, they must be applied in a relevant horizontal direction. 
In other words, we will choose a critical direction to apply the forces. It will not just be applied in any howling, uh, in the direction in which the earthquake possibly has occurred, but it will take a, a direction that is relevant and critical in the application. Now, under the two nonlinear methods, that is the pushover and the dynamic, they are normally applied in plastic analysis. Now, remember in our case, we are dealing with elastic analysis. We are limiting our structure only in the elastic zone. We are not assuming that we cannot be able to, we can get into the plastic analysis. Basically, plastic analysis is considered when you are doing uh, structural steel in most cases, because steel can get into the, into the plastic area or zone. So therefore, to expand more on elastic response spectrum, have a slide here. The ground motions are governed by two elastic spectrum. In an earthquake occurs, normally we have two kinds of spectrum that will be generated. We have the horizontal elastic uh, response spectrum and vertical elastic response spectrum. Now, out of these, we will we'll have a shape of an elastic response spectrum. It normally has four branches, as I've indicated in this curve. So the curve will have four branches, whereby we'll have an excitation from an earthquake. So that will then lead to us between point S to point TB or T subscript B. These are parameters that we're going to check on them. So from parameter S, which is the soil factor, all the way to parameter TB, it is referred to as the very low period, whereby we are having the earthquake gaining uh, momentum. Then between TB to TC, we have second branch, which is normally referred to as the constant acceleration zone. We then have constant velocity zone. And then finally, zone four, we have the constant displacement. We are going to check on these factors depending on several factors that uh, uh, we can be able to develop uh, from the tables which we are going to see. So out of that, then we have two kinds of spectra. We have type one and type two kind of spectrum. Type one in most cases, it is a spectrum that you adopt when you're considering a very strong kind of an earthquake that has occurred. On the other side, type two, it is a kind of spectrum that will pick when the earthquake is not strong. The code has provided a value of less than 5.5 magnitude, of course, in richer scale. Then out of it, if you want to pick the parameters, as I've said, the parameter of S, T, B, T, C, and T, D, if it's a strong earthquake, we'll borrow or pick the values from table number 3.2 of the code. While if you're dealing with, a, with type two kind of an earthquake, then we'll pick the values from table number 3.3 of the code. Colleagues, then in the next slide, just about to finish. We're then considering the lateral force method, which has been expounded more in clause number 4.3.3.2. Now, several factors and formulas, which just uh, uh, borrowed them here. How can we then be able to determine the value of uh, uh, the natural period? So the code provides a formula there. And for us to get the formula or the value of T1, we get the value of the factor CT multiplied by H raised to power 0 0.75. However, this limits the case up to 40 meters height of a building. Alternatively, if it is bigger than that, the natural period can be determined by that formula indicated there, two root of D. Now the design spectrum has been provided in terms of some equations, which you're going to see, equation 3.2 to 3.5, of the euro code eight. Then after that, we'll then be able to determine what is referred to as the base shear force. And this base shear force, we can get its value in that clause number 43322. It's just a formula which has been provided in the code. The values of it or the parameters have also been, have been also been uh, 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 discussed in the code. So really I may not be able to, you know, produce them at that point there. Finally, after we have observed, uh, obtained the base shear force, we then laterally distribute it upwards so that we can then be able to get what is the amount of force at each flow level. Now, this we are going to, di to distribute it depending on two things. One, 
is the mass at that flow level. So depending on the mass, of course, the mass here, the code requires us to change the mass in terms of tonnage. So the mass at each flow level, that will dictate the amount of force that can be transmitted at that point, and also the type or the shape of the deformed mode. Now, when a structure is subjected to dynamic loading, it will, it will, it will, it will resonate in such a way that then the frame will tend to form some shapes. And these shapes depend on the amount or determine the amount of force that can be distributed. I provided a formula there on the right side of the slide, whereby it gives us how we can be able to distribute the forces at each floor level. Lastly then, colleagues, we thought of summing it up by having an example so that this example can then be able to work it from scratch. So it's an example here, just a simple one, which says that the plan and elevation of a three-story reinforced concrete structure, uh, which is a school building, is shown in the next slide. So suppose to determine the design seismic loads on the structure using this data which you have provided. We're assuming that the structure is being constructed in seismic zone five. The type of soil or stratum that is being built, it is medium stiff. We also have the building uh, frame here. We are adopting the special moment resisting frame. The beam sizes have been given to be 200 by 300, I mean 500 millimeter deep. The column sizes are 400 by 400 millimeters. A slab thickness you're assuming is a 150 millimeter slab. They're using masonry with 200 millimeters um, width uh, with a height of uh, three meter and the density we are assuming it to be 20 kilonewton per cubic meter. And also the concrete density just made an assumption of 25 kilonewton per cubic meter. And first, lastly here in this last slide, we are having the plan of the building and its elevation. The plan has columns which are spaced at four meters in both planes. And we have an elevation of a building which is 3.5 meters height in each story. Now, the terminology of story and flows, I think it, it is debatable, but uh, how we have adopted it is that story is a space in between two flows. So like, for example, in this elevation, this is a three-story building. It is a three-story building because the first story, it is in between the ground floor and the first suspended floor slab. Second story, it is between first and second suspended floor slab. While third story is between the third and um, the second uh, suspended uh, floor uh, slabs. Thank you so much for your um, attention. I take it back to Ndolo for some guidance before possibly we move to the solution of this example. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Daktari. Uh, right now, uh, I think uh, Abdi should be in a position to give us direction so that we know if we can start questions. And uh, Lawrence uh, is also on foot. Thank you so much, uh, Ndolo. Uh, I think uh, we have gone through the slide that we wanted to present on just the introduction which we've done uh, just the introduction. We've not gone into detail because uh, we were just wanted to just introduce this thing and again, uh, go into more details uh, when it comes now to doing the real example so that engineers can understand it from uh, first principle, how we go about it, where we get uh, the, the loadings, how we, go, uh, how we get the loadings and uh, how we use the particular tables that are needed for the kind of uh, design that we're going to do. And I think in the next, in, in this second uh, session, we are going to do a, a, a design sample from scratch so that uh, we use the same example that is being given with the parameters that has been shared by Dr. Fundi. So that from there now we can go to an extent whereby we are not going to handle the, we're not going to handle the moments now, the design of moments, but we, are, we want to go up to the place where we can get the, the, the lateral force uh, for every building, uh, for every slab layer. So that is what we will handle from scratch up to the up, up to up to the session whereby we are going to get the force now acting at every uh, particular particular flow. So I think with that I can allow 
uh, Dr. Fundi, if he has already, if he if is if he's, uh, ready to, to take us through that session, so that now we can uh, we can we can do an example. And I've seen already he has shared the Excel sheet. So kindly, Dr. Fundi, kindly take us through that. And again, Thank you, Abdi. if anyone has a question, I think uh, after taking through the example, then we can raise the questions. So then from there, we will answer questions uh, one by one. Kindly, Dr. Fundi, take over. I would prefer the questions be typed on the chat room so that we, are, we can uh, navigate easily. And uh, in the meanwhile, Lawrence can be able to take care of some questions that are being put there. Thank you so much for that guidance. I just wanted the direction whether we take questions first on the theoretical part or we go directly to this design. I've just shared um, a workout. I've just done a workout on an Excel sheet here. It's manually done. Um, Dolo, your guidance? Let, let's, let's, let's do the, 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 the example first and then we will take all the questions together because somebody might ask a question that is directly related to a practical thing yet you've not covered the practical so let's go uh, to the practical example and then we can take all questions at once thank you so much uh members so here i have a working out just a small design sheet on the left is the um, the reference area i'm referring to euro code 8 part one of the year 2004 providing my calculations of the middle and uh, having an output to to the end now uh, in the sheet that we had shared, or the example that we had shared, the total length, the structure was eight meters by eight meters. So the first thing that I've calculated there is the floor area. So the floor area there is an area of 64 square meter. Then I have then gone ahead to determine the seismic weight. Where are we getting the loading? So two kinds of loading here, we get dead load, and impose load first from the structure. Now, starting with the level, so I've distributed them in terms of level. So we have the third floor, um, which I'm taking it to be the roof. In this case, the roof has no access. Then we have the second floor, the first ground, and then we get the total dead load. So at each of these levels, there are different kinds of structural elements that we have to consider them. This uh, case, we have a slab, we have beams, we have walls, and I should mention here, the walls have only assumed that they are on the outer part, so they are only exterior walls. Then we have columns, provided loading in terms of kilonewton and the mass in terms of tonnage. So in the third floor, since there is it's a flat slab, I've then calculated the loading on the slab the slab was having a thickness of 150 millimeters. So I've done that to be 0 0.15. I've multiplied it by the density of concrete, multiplied by unit meter. And then I've also multiplied it by the area so that I get the total loading. So I get the total loading there in terms of kilonewtons of 240 kilonewton. Then beams are also there in this third floor. Now we are having the beams are of size 200 by 500 millimeters. So that one is multiplied 0 0.2 by 0 0.5 multiplied by the density. The beams, if you count on them, I just did the, um, a, a quick just um, calculation there that there are six beams crossing each other. They are all of the same length. Total length of them, they are eight meters. That is from end to end, from one grid line to the last grid line. And that then gives us a total of 120. Since this is a, a roof, there are no walls. So there is no loading for walls. There is no column at that point. So the total load then, the total dead load becomes 360 kilonewton. Convert that in terms of tonnage, then that becomes approximately 36.73 tonnage. In the second floor, this is a floor which is spanning from second floor to the third floor. So there are slab, there is a slab. Again, the same calculation gives us 240. There are beams giving us again 140. We have walls. Again, here I should mention that the wall are on the outer part. The wall has a thickness of 200 millimeters, so that's 80.2. The total length, I've just made an assumption there. It can be eight, that is covering the whole length. 
we have the density of it is, is about 20. Then uh, I have multiplied by three, which is the height multiplied by four, because I've just assumed that there are four walls on the outer. That gives a total loading of 384. We have columns. Columns, they are size 400 by 400, multiplying it by the density, multiplying by the height of the column, which is 3.5 meter, and there are nine of them giving us 126, totaling to 870. And then lastly, we have the mass in terms of tonnage. First floor, again, repeating the same thing as, uh, as second floor, and that gives us 88. Finally, on the ground floor, on the ground floor, I just made an assumption that the ground floor has the same thickness. There are no beams in the ground floor. We have walls just as above. We have columns, again, just as above, giving us a total of 750, and then the total uh, tonnage, a total dead load of about 2850 kilonewton. Now, on the imposed load, again, I've spread it out in terms of the levels. Made an assumption that uh, since the roof has no access, then there will be no um, imposed load there. On second floor, we are having that, um, now, where have I picked a value? I've referred to BA6399, which gives us the imposed loading depending on the use of the structure, uh, the occupants of the structure. So the value can differ. But here yeah, I've just picked a value of three. Uh, that value where have I picked it is from BS6399. Uh, and I've uh, multiplied it by the area, giving that value. Of course, all along from second, first, and ground floor. That gives us a total imposed load of about 576 kilonewton. Then I referred to clause number 3.2.4 of the code so that I can now be able to get load combination. Now, here it is seismic load. It is not the normal combination of dead and live. Say, for example, the way we take it in normal construction, where the partial safety factors will be 1.4 GK plus 1.6 QK. Now the Eurocode provides a different kind of combination where it provides dead load plus phi subscript EIQ. And it proposes that we take a value of phi subscript EI. If you get it, uh, I should mention that this value is being obtained from Eurocode uh, one. Uh, the value of phi EI is 0 0.3. So therefore I have, I have calculated that to obtain total building weight in terms of kilonewton the value of 3022.8 kilonewton. Now we were told in the example that we are doing this building in seismic zone five. So from clause number 3222, part 2P, since it is seismic zone five, then we'll choose type one spectrum. Remember I had mentioned that we have type one and type two spectrum. So we are picking type one spectrum. Table number 3.1 of the code, that is again is of um, the Euro code. It provides a list of different types of grounds or ground conditions. Now, our case, we are told that uh, the building is being done in a medium stiff kind of a ground. Now, out of that, in table number 3.1, then we get the ground type to be type C. Now, since then we get those values, we can then be able to get the parameters, the soil factor, the TB, the TC, and TD. Now, since we are using type one spectrum, we then pick these parameters, what I refer to them as spectral parameters from table number 3.2. In table number 3.2, if you'll check it, the value of S is provided there as 1.15, the value of TB is 0 0.2 of second, TC is 0 0.6 second, and TD is 2.0 of second. Now I've then picked this peak ground acceleration value. What I had presented in the slides, I had presented from one all the way to four with different values. Now it, it is provided there that any other value up and above starting from five or seismic zone five upwards to seismic zone eight, the value of peak ground acceleration is given as three meters per square second. So that is what I have used. This value is not provided directly from the code or the Eurocode eight. I'm picking it from reference tables. 
So with those values, then referring to table number 4.3 to determine the importance class of our structure. Now we have been told that this building is going to be used as a school building. So the code therefore provides that it falls under importance class three with a factor of 1.2. So out of it, then I can be able to get the ground factor, which is a multiplication of phi one AGR. And that gave us a value of approximately 3.6 meter per second. So with that value then, we can then be able to determine the seismic max calculation. I've again broken it down in terms of the flows level. So at the roof level, we had calculated that the, the, the dead load is 360 kilonewton. There is no live load because there is no access. So if we put it in the combination that we have seen above there, we then get a value of, that is G, our G is 360. Of course, we add it to 0 0.3 times the, uh, times the imposed load. So we end up getting a value of 360 kilonewton. The total mass in terms of turn uh, is 36.73. The same way in second floor, first and ground. In second floor, the value is 870, the dead load. The live load was 192. So getting the combination that gives us 94.65. Similarly, and we get a total seismic mass of 308.44 tons. Then finally, we'll be able to do the seismic analysis because before we do design, then we have to, to do analysis of it. So I'm following the lateral force method of analysis where I've obtained the first thing, the natural period as expressed in that um, uh, formula there. And here we are told that we are using a reinforced concrete structure. So under this clause four, three, three, two, two, the code provides that if you're dealing with a concrete structure, which it is resisting the moment. So this is a concrete moment resisting frame. The value of CT is given as 0 0.075. Of course, other values are given there depending on the kind of the moment resisting frame. So out of it, then we can be able to calculate the value of T1 or the natural uh, period. Now, after getting the natural period, we have to calculate the value of SD so that we can get what is the behavior uh, factor of the building. Uh, so we are getting the SD is given in, according to the limitation there. Now there are several formulas that we can be able to pick from clause number 3.2.2.5, depending on the value of T1 that you have obtained. Say for example, if our value of T1 is ranging between zero and not more than the value of uh, TB, then the code provides an equation. In our case here, the value ranges between, or the value of T1 ranges between TB and TC. So if you check in the code, which is in page number 42, that is close number, uh, 3225, to get the design spectrum for elastic analysis, we use then that formula. This formula, I'm just picking it from the code depending on this limitation. So out of it, we can then now be able to get what we are referring to as the ductility class. Now there are three classes. However, our building is done using reinforced concrete. And then Force concrete, sometimes it is not as ductile as compared, say, to structural steel. And therefore, this will make us to use ductility class medium. It is not low because, again, there will be some accommodation of some, some, some ductility or some um, uh, uh, bending which can be accommodated when you are dealing with uh, reinforced concrete. So we have picked the ductility class medium, and the value is given there as 3.0. Uh, mu u divided by mu one. And uh, according to that clause, we are dealing with a multi-story building or a multi-story structure with more than one bay. So then it is a multi-bay because the limitation is that whether you are dealing with just not a multi-story and a single bay. So in our case, then it is a multi-bay, multi-story structure and the value of mu u divided by one, it is given as 1.3.
And that gives us a behavior factor of about 3.9 of the building. So therefore, we can then be able to determine what is our design spectra for elastic analysis, given there's SD to be a value of approximately 2.65 meters per square second. Now with that value, finally, we can then be able to determine the base shear force. In this case, I'm picking equation number 4.5 of the code with that formula of FB or the base shear force given as SD, of course, with respect to time, multiplied by the mass, multiplied by lambda. And the limitation in our case is that the value of our natural period, it is less than two TC. And so the value of lambda there, we can obtain it as 0 0.85. Other values have been given in that, uh, under that formula. So out of it, we get a base shear force of about 694.76 kilonewton. Now this is the total force that is applied at the base of the structure due to the seismic uh, action in this condition. Finally, colleagues, I have then distributed this loading or the base shear force on each floor level using equation number 4.11 as provided in the code. There are two equations which are provided in this equation. They are depending on either you're, whether you're using mass or whether you're using expression as given in equation number 4.10. So since you have calculated using the masses of the flows, I've decided to use equation number 4.11 of the Euro code. Each level from the roof all the way to the ground. So I have the level, the roof, second, first, and the ground. What is the height from the ground for the roof? It is 10.5 meter. Why 10.5? Because our structure was 3.5 meter interval between the floors. So 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, that gives us about 10.5. Then we have second floor, then it will be at seven meter. First floor will be at 3.5 meter. Of course, ground floor will be at the base point, which is zero. Then what is the mass in terms of tonnage? This mass we have calculated. We found that at the roof, the total mass was 36.7. Second, it was 94.64. First, again, it was just 94.65. And at the ground, it was 82.41. We again get the, the product of Z subscript I and M subscript I, giving us 381.89 and the other values. Then using equation number 4.11, of course, multiplying with the base shear force, multiplying by this value, dividing it by the summation, we can be able to get the lateral force at each floor level. So for the roof level, we then can be able to say that the value at the, the horizontal value, the horizontal lateral force in terms of kilonewton, which has been applied due to the earthquake, is a value of 192 kilonewton. At the second, it is 334.6 kilonewton. At the first is 167.3 kilonewton. Of course, if you do a summation of this value, it should be able to give us the total base shear force at the end of the day. Then from there, we can then be able to do an analysis of this subframe, which possibly can be covered in module two. Thank you so much for your attention. Dolo. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry. And I think right now, if I'm properly guided, I think it's question times and the questions that are there, I would allow Lawrence to uh, read them for us so that, uh, presenters can now uh, tackle them. Lawrence? Uh, uh, thank you, Dolo. Uh, the first question is being asked by Purity. And she's asking that, uh, do we, do we, do we use this, this process for systems? How do we determine a CT for an hybrid uh, building system with concrete moment resisting frame and steel bracing or uh, other combinations? So I hope Purity that question uh, I've asked it in the right way. I hope, engineer, you're fully you're noting them down. Yes, I am. Then, uh, uh, then one other person was asking. Uh, it was Kagunya Festas. He was asking if uh, we share the material, especially 
the Excel, but I'm of the opinion that uh, maybe you convert it to a PDF and share so that people can develop their own. Uh, but the PowerPoint slides uh, you can share, as we can share to the members so that they can be able to follow through the notes. Uh, the, you can answer Purity's question as I read uh, through uh, Mugambi's uh, question. She's asking if this process or systems can be, uh, she's asking how we can determine uh, CT for a hybrid, uh, a hybrid building system. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Lawrence. Yes. Yeah. Thank you if I can hear you. Th thank you. Um, the value of CT, it's not like, um, I'm, I'm, allow me to refer to the course so that, uh, uh, because that's, that's my way of guidance. <laughs> Um, the value of CT, um, I've said we are, we are getting it from uh, uh, clause number 43322, uh, but for quick reference, if you can allow me, it is page number 57 of the Euro code. And there, um, there are three values which have been provided there for value of CT. You'll take the value of CT to be equivalent yeah. to... Engineer Fundi. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, I do. I will kindly suggest that uh, if you can share now, if, if you can share uh, the, those tables in Eurocode, yeah, so that it, it, it comes out in the, in the, on the screen. Okay. So when you talk about those clauses, you can show them directly where it is so that we will use those questions. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, this is page number 57. Sorry, I was referring to a hard copy, but if you allow me, I can uh, I'm just getting to my soft copy of uh, the Euro code. Uh, this is Euro code um, eight. I'm scrolling to page number 57 as indicated in that document. There, there are three values which have been provided there. Uh, so allow me again to share this page that I'm referring. Uh, if you can allow me that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at three values. The value of CT, it indicates, everyone can see this one? Yeah, yes, you can continue kindly, you can see. You can see it, so here, here is where I'm referring. This is equation number 4.6. The value of T1 is indicated that it is CT, the height of the building raised to power three quarter, which of course is 0 0.75. So where it is getting that CT is given as a 0 0.085 for a moment resisting space steel frame. The value will turn to 0 0.075 for moment resisting space concrete frame. And for eccentrically braced steel frame, the value goes to 0 0.50 for all the other kind of structures. So purity, I don't know whether you answered that for all other kind of structures, if are not the ones which has been specified there, the value you pick it will be 0 0.05. Lawrence? Engineer, now I with think, your guidance. Uh, yes. I, I, think, I think what you've done is so beautiful. People have uh, now understood where you're getting the values. Yes. And I, I think uh, I'll just uh, request if, uh, if you can uh, take people through now from close uh, 4.332 starting from the natural period, uh, as, you, as you show whatever you, you have here on the screen, uh, the, uh, the screen you're showing. Yes. So that you, you can take them through so that they get to see where the, you get the natural period, where you get the concrete for whatever, just step by step through the Euro code that they can see. Thank you. Now, here I'm, I'm at uh, close number 4.3 or 4.3.3.2, which is, which is the lateral force method of analysis. As I said, there are four of them. There are four methods, but we have only limited ourselves to lateral force method of analysis. Again, why? Because this building is, uh, we are not, we are assuming that it is still within the elastic zone of the structure. It has not gone to the plastic. So we are not doing plastic analysis or plastic design. We are in the elastic design. And um, our building is regular, both in plan and uh, in elevation. So under this, the value of T1, for it to be analyzed or for you to analyze under lateral force method of analysis, then this is the limitation that the value of T1 must be either less than or equal to 4TC or 2.0 seconds. That is all the code provides. And of course, all the other uh, criteria have to be met, like what I've said about regularity, uh, which you can be able to get it in this clause. Then after that, of course, the, the other uh, thing which is important to determine is the base shear force. 
this is the amount of force that it is it is obtained after there is an earthquake uh, say subjected to a building so once you get this force is the one that you're going to to spread it across or upwards now the formula is given there as i said this is just a formula you pick from from the code equation number 4.5 as indicated here so the value of sd uh, we have determined it of course depending on the on the uh, the, the type of spectrum that you have used. You have used type one and you have picked the values from table number 3.2 and build it up. So T1 is the fundamental period that we have determined above there. M is the total mass of the building, of course, as you have seen uh, the way I've built it up uh, in, in accordance to the elements that you're having. So you can be able to build up until you get what is the total mass of, of the building. Now, one thing that you need to know here we are only considering mass of the building above the foundation or above the top of the rigid. So I've not included the weight of the foundation. Yes, the foundation is there, but you don't include it. But if there is, there is a basement, then you have to include that basement because the basement is not the foundation. Below the basement, there has to be a foundation. Of course, again, the value of lambda, which is a correction factor, has been given there depending on the limitations. If your value of, of, of T1 is less than 2TC and it has more than two stories, then the value becomes 0 0.85. And in our case, we had a building which is multi bayed and of course it is more than two stories. In our case, it is three story. Again, as I said, the definition of story, you have to get it right because uh, in, in our case, it is, not, it is not a two story per se. It is a three story. As I said, a story is space in between two floors, the ground, say for example, and any other suspended floor. The value becomes 1.0 for any other case. If it, is, if it is bigger than two TC, and if you're not dealing with more than uh, two story. Uh, after that, of course, I've talked about the value of T1 or the natural period. Then after that, this is the alternative way of determining the value of uh, CT. You have to get the value of A subscript C if you want it alternatively through this formula, uh, 4.7 and 4.8. If you allow me to scroll down, here is where I was talking about the distribution of horizontal forces. So once you determine what is your base shear force, you can then be able to distribute it at the flow levels, either using equation number 4.10 or equation 4.11. So I've used equation 4.11 because we had calculated masses of the building. So Z, I, and Z, J, in this case, they are masses of the building. But if you're using equation number 4.10, then you are going to determine displacement. Remember, displacement of the masses. Now, from structural dynamics, if you have done structural dynamics, which I believe maybe some of us have covered, now when you're doing structural dynamics and you get the model shapes, the model shapes can be able to give us the displacement of the building from its rest position. Either to the left or to the right. And there are different model shapes that can be obtained depending on the amount of excitation. In this case, the excitation comes from the seismic uh, action or the, the earthquake. So I've not done displacement, but we have used masses. So that's why I've used equation number 4.11. Yes, Lawrence. Uh, someone else was asking about uh, uh, conservative design. You know, by conservative, they mean that uh, you get the uh, the maximum uh, base shear and apply it to the entire building rather than going floor by floor and uh, uh, reducing it. I don't know what would be your response to that. Sure, it is. Just like the way I, I believe I, I saw in our, just to get a little bit off, I saw somebody saying that, uh, you know, they can, they can offer wind design or wind analysis. Wind analysis, basically, you know, up to that point, we just get the same way like what we get in wind analysis because wind force blows to a structure and it, indu it, it gives us a total horizontal loading. But that total horizontal loading, later on when now we are doing analysis of the subframe, you have to appreciate the amount of uh, the amount of force that is subjected at each flow level so that we can be able to get the 
the, the bending moment and the shear force at that point, because those bending moment and shear force are the ones that are going to be able to transfer them. Now, if I were, if you were doing um, wind loading, we'll get what is the areas. Say, for example, we have a total horizontal uh, or lateral force of uh, X amount, then we share it, we share it across depending on the amount of the of the height. So if our structure is having different heights, say maybe the ground floor is three meters, uh, the other floors or, or four, four meters ground floor, and then the others are three meter, three meter. We can share it depending on the area of influence. So yes, it is possible. Uh, however, at the end of the day, it will be prudent for you to get um, the amount of horizontal loading at each floor level for the sole purpose of doing analysis or for the obtaining of uh, your bending moment and shear forces uh, to carry on with the design later on. Yes, Lawrence. Uh, okay, just, to, but... just to add on that, engineer, you, you can also observe that uh, the forces at every level are, are different. Eh? So as you go up the building, the forces tend to increase. The lateral force tends to increase. So how will he now take care of the differences? You know, when he uses just a a, 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 a common uh, a common load, you know, because if you look at the example that we've given, that uh, let's say the, the the first floor is has lesser load than the next floor than the next floor when it comes to to, to the earthquake co component. Okay, yes. that uh, sorry, sorry to to I, th I think that is a. Uh... Uh, understood. I think uh, uh, the, the member was asking that because simply because uh, you know in the in the industry uh, people keep saying uh, conservative uh, conservative design, where you always pick the maximum uh, if it's a bending moment, the maximum bending moment, and use it to design uh, throughout the beam or throughout the column or throughout any member, and not go uh, say uh, step by step and breaking it down to. Uh, certain locations of the beam and taking those moments for design. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is why the member was asking about uh, about uh, conservative design, I believe. And so uh, Lawrence, you see, yes. you see Lawrence, if, if they used, if they use the, the most, uh, the, the maximum, uh, let's say force, we will end up now over designing for the other purpose. You see now for the, for the lower floors, we will be end up over designing those uh, kind of elements. And, and you know, uh, over designing is even worse than under designing in terms of structural uh, co concept. So those are the things that uh, it's uh, sometimes it's better to just go uh, the, from, from first principle so that you get whatever is needed uh, at each level instead of just uh, looking at the most critical force, applying it in, uh, in all elements and uh, designing it. So that one, it will bring an aspect of over designing. And, and I think sometimes uh, over designing is not uh, better, is not good. It's better for someone maybe to under design or have a balanced design than over design. So that is another thing I could just uh, share out. Yeah, that, that is understood perfectly. And then the next question to engineer is, uh, Piruj is still is, is asking that, uh, can you kindly expand further on uh, the ground type effect on the on seismic action? So I think on that one again, Engineer Fundi, I will I would really I would really want you to go back uh, to, to to where you are at uh, Eurocode uh, eight. I want you to show those people the tables so that they understand. You know you ca you've captured well the other part, but I want you to show them each table so that they understand where the values are, are coming from and how you choose those particular values for specific areas. Kindly, sure, I, I can do that. Um, uh, the ground. Allow me just to scroll a little bit faster. Sorry, uh, so that I, I I get to that point a little bit um, uh, faster. It's table number three point one, I believe so, of the Euro code. Um, uh, in this case, they are different here. Yeah. Um, this is table number three point one, ground types. Sorry, I've just jumped into it. Possibly I should. Uh, begin from this clause, 3.1.2. Now here, the code provides a discussion about the different kind of ground types. There are, there, are, uh, there, there, are, there are number there. Here we have ground type A, B, C, D, and E, based of course determined from the stratigraphic profiles of, um, of course, say for example, you have decided to do pits to check that place. 
So out of these ground types, there is a note here which has been provided that it is out of these uh, ground types. And again, the code uh, with its versatility, it allows the national annex uh, to be included. And it is the one that can now be able to give us the parameters S. S is the soil type, TB is the lower, TC is the higher, and TD is the final point. The parameters that guide us on how we can be able to see the spectral shape. In other words, when you are presenting the theoretical background, you know, when an excitation has, has, been, um, has been induced in a building, that building will not continue resonating forever. It will be dumped in one way or the other, either because of friction or because of vis uh, viscous uh, dumping mechanisms of the structure or any other kind of way that a building can be, can, can be able to be dumped or the, the, the resonation or the, the hysteresis. They have to be died off. Otherwise, it cannot be able to continue oscillating forever. So then that is what we get in the spectral shape. The next page, then we get the ground types. So say, for example, in this case, the ground types have been defined here and that small description given and the parameters that you can be able to get the velocities. So like, for example, ground type A, the code says that this is when you're dealing with rock or other rock-like geological formation, including at most five meter of weaker material at the surface. Type B is deposit. So there are, there, are, there are classes which have been categorized in this case. That is table number 3.1. Then after you have, of course, and I'm assuming that first of all, before doing a structure, you have checked on the geological part. So after you have covered the geological part, you can be able to get what is the ground type that you're dealing with. Then from there, we can then now be able to go to, to table number three, either table number 3.2 or table number 3.3, depending on uh, the kind of spectra that you have picked. Now, this spectra just picked it from here. This is figure number 3.1. So we are having the value of S, which is the soil type, which is why we are concerned about the soil type, because a building which is resting, say, for example, on ground type A, it cannot resonate the same way it has, maybe the same building you do it in, in a very loose soil. They will, they will, they will, uh, you know, differ in terms of uh, uh, their resonation. So out of that, depending on the type of spectra, if you have picked spectra one or type one spectra, we pick the values here of the value of S, T, B, T, C, and T, D. Now here we have the ground type, the one that you have picked from table number one. Now we use type or uh, table three point two for type one elastic response spectra. Alternatively we'll use table number 3.3 .3 for values of type two elastic response spectra. And this again gives you the value. The guiding principle here is, first of all, you have to get what is the ground type. Where are you doing your building? And then the other values will follow. Yes, Lawrence. Uh, okay, that is, uh, that is well understood. And I think for the members is, uh, we can say that, uh, Basically, as we pro as we proceed more into the into the module two and module three like that, it will be easy to understand and uh, easy to follow through. And perhaps, uh, as one member had asked, is uh, if you could share the tabulations, but not in an Excel file. Yes, I yes. still insist you just make it into a PDF so that uh, you know. I think when you share the raw file, I tend to believe it promotes laziness. And, uh, <laughs> Someone will just be feeding figures, not understanding where it is coming from, and they say they are doing it. So I would, uh, as part of the package, you'll share the notes as a PDF, and then that will be, uh, that perhaps will encourage members to follow through and do it themselves. I, will. Uh, uh, I see there are no questions uh, from the members. I, uh, I would encourage them to ask as many questions as possible. Or if there are no questions, uh, uh, since you know we've been here for one hour twenty minutes, and uh, sure. it is substantial time. I think we have spent uh, you spent uh, a good amount of time explaining uh, through the concepts and making members understand. And and since I see there are no questions, we'll give a few minutes, and then perhaps we can break, and members can give comments. So I, I give it back to Abdi. 
Th thank you so much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, so far for this, for, for this uh, module, we have uh, covered what we promised, uh, whereby we, we, we took members through the theoretical part of it, which we are going to share the slides. And again, we, we made sure that the members now understand the issue, how, how you go about the seismic action, how you get your loadings, and uh, how you calculate the stress development. And again, finally, uh, it took us up to the first story levels, which is what we have achieved. I think in the next session, uh, we, are going to, we, are, we are going to work on now the cantilever method so that now we can get now to to know how the how much how how these uh, level uh, loadings are affecting uh, structural elements when it comes to maybe columns and beams and uh, how do we get the moments at those particular structural elements then on the third uh, module now we will look at now design after getting after after that, doing the analysis uh, we've done the analysis clearly now we have got the loadings that are affecting the building in terms of earthquake and at at each particular slab level and again if we have now known the effect of that loading in structural elements whereby we have, got, we have already gotten the uh, bending moments and the shear forces, now we will go on the element of now combining both the, the design, uh, doing the design for the element uh, with, with both moments due to earthquake and again moments due to the normal uh, gravitational loadings. So, so that is the last part of it. And, and for this module, I think we have covered uh, very well on the first part of it, whereby we are, we are, we are taking it to the point whereby we, we can get now the, the forces, the lateral forces at each story level. That was our target for, to, for today. And I think we have taken people through the theoretical part of it, uh, the issues of stability, strength, and serviceability, uh, issues of construction techniques, issues of uh, seismic vibration control, and also now we have already introduced members to the first part, which is the lateral force analysis. Uh, and, and again, we have managed to break lateral force analysis and uh, we have done an example of it. Uh, and, 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 and we have managed to clear the first module. So members uh, kindly bear with us. We are going to share all the content that uh, we have been talking about in this module. And uh, we are going to share it as advised uh, by, by Lawrence so that uh, we are going to give it in PDF format. And so that it can all, also encourage people to go about it. Kindly, when you're going through the example, kindly have your Euro code with you so that you can check specific clauses and you will understand. Once you have it and you, you do them uh, side by side, uh, you will understand because we have given the reference in, in, in the calculation. We have given the reference and we have given the calculations also and the output. The only thing I would want to, 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 to just say when it comes to the presentation that we've made when it, in, in matters uh, calculation, for, for the walling, for the walling, you will have to reduce the height of the beam because uh, the doctor has presented from a floor slab to floor slab level, which is around, if you're doing it in the field, so for the walling, you will consider below the beam up to the floor slab if you're putting it. So if it is three meter and uh, the beams like for this one, we were considering uh, 500 depth. So we'll remove the 500 depth. That means you're remaining with a wall height of 2.5. So those are the small, small areas we can fine tune. But uh, Dr. Fundi has done a very good job uh, on, in, on this first module. And we are going to work together so that now in the second module, now we can take members through now the analysis part of it. Thank you okay. so much, uh, okay. uh, Lawrence. Okay. Uh, before we break, there's a question and a comment. Uh, a member asked it, it is Mugambi was asking that, uh, can you talk about the whip effect uh, on the top floor? And then uh, our very able member, Engineer Shama, is asking that, uh, is perhaps throwing a challenge to us that uh, there's a section where Engineer Fundi was referring to BS 6399. And uh, Shama is throwing the span to the wheel and saying that perhaps we should make reference to uh, Euro Code 1 because, again, remember by next year, all of us should be, uh, should be using uh, Euro Codes. So, Engineer Fundi, the challenge has been thrown that uh, we, make ref we also make references to, uh, to e Euro Code as well. And uh, I would like to tell Shama that the challenge has been taken up and we will... Uh, Look into that, but in the meantime, it is always good to refer to what you know as you move to new knowledge, rather than just uh, if you change all the codes, it will be difficult for members to follow. So, Lawrence, I, 
Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lawrence. I totally agree with um, Engineer Shama. Uh, uh, I'm seeing his, his, his question here that uh, we either refer to Eurocode 1 or the UK National Annex uh, as adopted in uh, Eurocode uh, 2012. Uh, I, I totally agree. It's only that I was trading very carefully because I, I you know, some of or most of members. I think we have based our design mostly to uh, British standards because currently, you know, even when you're doing like, for example, design of timber or design of uh, wind, uh, most of us still go back to PS code. Even the, the common material concrete, um, very few people uh, do design in Eurocode one or two. Um, that, that, but I take up the challenge in most cases I have I, I, I have really um, adopted and referred to Euro codes. It's only that sometimes you also trade carefully because you people say, then you have your design, where will it be approved? And people are proving using uh, the normal BS code. Yeah, um, well we yeah, we perfect by Mugambi, Ernest. I think, uh, and that is what like uh, what Abdi was saying, you know, when you're dealing with, um, with, uh, with horizontal loading and uh, due to the seismic action, we have different kind of model shapes. These different kind of model shapes you can you can 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 realize like for example in our case we had a, we 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 had a bigger force coming in at um at at second floor not even at the top. So it it depends again with the the lamp mass the amount of lamp mass that uh, that has uh, has been concentrated at, at at that point. And of course uh, I think that has uh, has been shown in the in the example that uh, we have done or in the working just a small working that uh, we have done. Yes, Lord. Uh, okay. Um, as you as you as you made the comment that the members were still using um, older codes, there are even members who are still using uh, CP three. For wind design, and they always say that uh, B, uh, BS 399 part two and all, all those other parts are difficult to follow and things like that. So there's always that uh, interlinkage between the older codes and the newer codes because not everything changes. It's only a few things that uh, change it for the better. So it is always good to refer back and forth or refer to an older code and a later code. And I think that is always acceptable. Can I interject, so, Lawrence? No problem. I'm sorry for that, for taking more of your time. No problem. You know, basically there are, there are, there are three design philosophies. Yeah. We have the permissible design philosophy, which is purely limited to the design of timber members. And, and, and that is what actually was based on uh, BS, uh, the, the BS for timber, the British standard for timber. Then came the load factor design philosophy, whereby it is a design philosophy where the CP or the code of practice was based to, you know, the determination of failure loads. Uh, and, and also that is the same design philosophy that is normally adopted when you're designing plastic analysis. Say for example, when you're designing portal frames or such kind of thing, it is, designed under the load factor. Then of course came the superior one, which is the limit state. The limit yeah. state now then introduced us to the range of going up to the ultimate limit stress okay. of, yeah. of the elements. So really okay. by, by the, growth of, um, the growth of materials uh, strength, we, we may not really fall back completely uh, to, 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 to earlier codes uh, because of those kind of um, advancements that have occurred. And I think that those are some of the things that possibly Eurocode have come to do away with. Because you realize that in Eurocode, we are now talking the same, you know, the same limits uh, as compared to BS, though in an, a little bit approved way, uh, as compared to if we limit ourselves to say CP110, and, yeah. and the earlier codes of that. Yeah, yeah, that is very true. Because, uh, for example, in steel in BS, mostly we were using uh, uh, steel with the strength of 275. Now, Eurocode accepts up to 355. Uh, the normal reinforcement, we are using uh, 460, and now we can go as far as 500 or 520. So those are improvements that uh, come with newer codes. And I think... Um, I can see just members are just saying heko and uh, giving you Kupewa uh, Kongole for the good session. 
and I would like to, I think it is, uh, if it is agreeable to the members, we can finish the meeting. Uh, I don't know if there's any good way of finishing the meeting uh, or, uh, or we can just say that we are going to end the meeting in two minutes and then we end the meeting in that manner. Uh, I would also like to, first of all, apologize for starting the meeting and disappearing. Of course, KPLC decided that they are going to unhang electricity, senior share. Mm -hmm. So that's why I disappeared for a moment. Uh, since there are no more questions or reactions from the members, and uh, uh, all this will be found on YouTube, our YouTube channel, and we will share the link in the group. Uh, all the material we will share in the group and also in the YouTube channel so that members can follow. And we promise to also do a module two, which we will plan and of course, uh, share the timings again. And um, I would like to thank you, uh, Engineer Fundi, for taking your time. And uh, I believe it, I believe uh, it is your passion. Uh, yeah, it is your passion and uh, from the reactions of the members, uh, many of your students are within the within the, <laughs> <laughs> within the congregations, and they are happy. We are now colleagues. We are we are, we are now colleagues. <laughs> I always say, "Mwalimu ni mwalimu." After ninety years later, <laughs> yeah, so we would like to say thank you so much for your time and uh, Abdi for also uh, organizing and making sure that everything is in order, and also co-hosting with you and. Um, and above all, Engineer Ndolo for giving us access to, to this session. Uh, I'm sure uh, Engineer Ndolo is, a, is, a, is an a telecommunication engineer, I believe. And uh, since we are engaging him more into these uh, civil engineering things, uh, one day, one time at Enda Mali, he will uh, give inputs in terms of civil engineering. So it is also good for him that uh, he's learning new things. So thank you so much, Ndolo. And uh, thank you so much, members. <laughs> Karibu. <laughs> he's saying that he's a, he's a quack CE. <laughs> no, All right. It is, it is only it is only locally, but globally, your 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 CV precedes you. And Lawrence. And yes. If, if you can allow me to say a, a word before you. Okay. Close. No problem. No problem. No problem. Welcome. My, my, mine, mine is just simple. I would like to encourage all the engineers also to share. You know, we may not be a monopoly with knowledge, but at least if we share the little we know, we can assist each other to grow, and at least we can empower each other. The small thing that you, you know. And, 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 and this initiative, uh, I think, Lawrence, we started it because that we want just to share small knowledge we have, and through that we can impact so many people. So I will also put a challenge to our seniors who are in this... Uh, our webinar today. To also Engineer take, Shama, Engineer Shama specifically. Yeah, so to also take time and share, and, and we are going to improve in the other uh, upcoming webinars. We are going to improve, we are going to share the material. This was just a, a, a first one, and we were doing it out of uh, our soft heart so that at least we can share the little knowledge we have. It was not uh, a professionally done, 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 done thing, but we are going to improve in those small areas. So kindly, Please let us share, let us share. That is just the word I can uh, give as my last word. Thank you so much. And I turn it back to you, uh, Lawrence, and Dolo to end the meeting now. So, so thank you, uh, Dolo. Uh, you can press the end button and thank you so much. See you next time. Uh, Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah. thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Fundi and uh, participants for this, uh, for those who joined. And uh, as you know, we were, we were uh, streaming live on YouTube. So once you go to the channel, you can find the link there. I've also shared it. You can always share with other persons who might have not been in this group or they're not in our general group uh, engineering forum. So just keep it up. Uh, I believe uh, we, by sharing many people, you learn, you learn, you learn from one another. Yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a telecom guy, but uh, learning some things of uh, civil is not bad. I learn because at the end of the day, when you go to a, a, a building design, you have to work hand in hand with all the other engineers involved, uh, yeah. civil, mechanical, and others. Uh, so it's a good thing that I'm also learning. 
but for now, uh, I hope we have started from some place. Let's move on to building up on this thing because I think uh, as uh, it was said earlier that the code has been accepted uh, since 2012 in Kenya. So let's build on it so that people have the latest uh, idea of how it is being done because, so that we don't lag so much behind. From 2012 to date, there's uh, seven years or, or roughly seven years that have passed and many people might still be lagging behind with the other codes. So let's uh, build up and I believe Abdi and Daktari can uh, assist on building up on this so that next time we have a improved uh, on the on on the the, the Euro code and the UK and N, so that we the young engineers coming from down they can know the old code that were there and the new one that is now being in used currently. Otherwise, uh, it's it's wonderful that we were able to be here, and I would like just to end the meeting and wish you uh, a success, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Good bye -bye. night. Good night. Bye-bye.